Guys, as you know, GoHunt.com Insider is the title sponsor of this podcast. And I want to tell you, you get a free $50 Kuyu gift card if you sign up for the GoHunt.com Insider. All you have to do is click on the blue Join Now button, use the promo code JSCOTT at closing, and they will send you an electronic gift card that you can use at Kuyu. I wanted to tell you why hunters prefer the Go Hunt Insider. There's unit analysis, statewide overview and summaries, state rules and regulations, species summary and trophy quality, application strategy articles, email reminders and notifications, quick and easy mobile access. You've got interactive game management unit maps, analysis of every season and species. You've got five-year harvest success and tag quota, uh, satellite imagery and terrain photos, camping and lodging recommendations, detailed on access and access issues, real-time rain and drought tracking, plus you get free gear and hunt giveaways, you get a free go hunt hat, and if you sign up using the J. Scott Outdoors, uh, or excuse me, the J. Scott promo code, you get a $50 Kuyu gift card. All you have to do is Hit the blue Join Now button and use the promo code JSCOTT. I want to thank GoHunt.com for their sponsorship of this podcast. This is the J. Scott Outdoors podcast on Western big game hunting and fishing brought to you by GoHunt.com Insider. Research faster, hunt more. Go to GoHunt.com forward slash Insider and join today. I'm your host, J. Scott, and I live and breathe hunting and fishing, spending half the year in the field experiencing God's creation. I hope you'll enjoy hearing about our adventures. Guys, I want to tell you about one of the sponsors of this podcast. DeadeyeOutfitters.com is a lifestyle hunting apparel company for hunters, by hunters. Check out episode 45 of this podcast with one of the owners and you'll see what I mean. Deadeye Outfitters makes quality t-shirts, sweatshirts, and hats designed with hunters in mind. Deadeye Outfitters has the only license for creating Boone and Crockett apparel. Use the J. Scott promo code and receive a 10% discount on all purchases at DeadeyeOutfitters.com. Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today we've got a really cool episode with Wade Heaton of Color Country Outfitters out of Utah. And uh, Wade is known for uh, being the guy to call and to go with for big mule deer in Utah. And I can't wait to pick his brain about uh, mule deer hunting and, and the success that he's had, and I'm excited to have him on. Wade, how you doing? I am good. Thanks, Jay. It's good to be on. Yeah, awesome. Wade, um, you know, I've heard of the Heaton Ranch for a long time. Um, you and I have never met, and I don't know that we've talked, but I've followed your stuff for quite a while. Um, can you give me a little bit of a history on Color Country Outfitters and um, your mule deer hunting and your love for mule deer hunting and outfitting? So, I kind of uh, I kind of fell into this uh, almost uh, on purpose. Uh, my family has owned a ranch here in southern Utah for about 75 years. It was a sheep and a cattle ranch for most of that time, and still is uh, a cattle ranch. Uh, about uh, 25 years ago, uh, actually 30 years ago to be exact, uh, the Ponsagant, which is in southern Utah was closed to hunting and uh, that the portion of that that was closed uh, was actually part of my family's ranch. When that got opened back up obviously the hunting was pretty good and we were approached by an outfitter uh, to lease our property which we did for a few years and uh, I was a, a teenager at the time and uh, obviously thought that was just the greatest thing ever so I would pal around with those guys the guides and uh, uh, really loved it. Uh, we got to a point where my dad realized we could probably do the same thing the outfitter was doing. So he started Color Country Outfitters about 1990. And uh, in the beginning, it was just the family ranch. It was just the Heaton Ranch. And, uh, and since then, has kind of uh, has spread. Uh, what you hear about the Heaton Ranch 
usually did not happen on the Heaton Ranch. Uh, now Color Country has about 40 ranches leased, and Heaton's just being one of them, and we hunt uh, quite a bit of public land as well. And so uh, usually what Color Country uh, gets attributed to them gets attributed back to the Heaton Ranch, but in reality it probably uh, didn't come from there. There's a lot of ranches around the, the family ranch that uh, are great mule deer properties and uh, just house some giant deer. And uh, uh, anyway, I, I'm lucky enough just to be in the right place at the right time. And uh, it uh, I just kind of fell into it. Uh, and it's been awesome. You know, in the last, uh, I started doing this full time in uh, 20 years ago, exactly 20 years ago this year. And I've just been fortunate. Uh, it's an awesome area I live in, and uh, there's giant deer. Yeah, I mean, I just watched a video when I was preparing for the episode, and it looks like you guys have a video that just came out that's a, a hundred bucks over two hundred inches. So, what I gather from that is you guys, Color Country Outfitters, has harvested a hundred hundred bucks over two hundred inches. You know, we have we actually made that video about a year and a half ago, and it's just kind of making the the circles now. Um, uh, at the end of 2014 season, we actually killed our 125th deer wow. for 200. Uh, just, just kind of remarkable. And I, I'm, I'm not even going to pretend like we're going to take the credit for most of that. Uh, we're just in a great area with some great deer. I mean, these deer are the ones growing the horns. We're not. We're just lucky enough to chase them. That's awesome, Wade. And so. Uh, most of the areas that you hunt are located inside the Ponsagon, what people hear as the Ponsagon, or are there other areas that are outside of the Ponsagon? We actually hunt three areas altogether, uh, obviously one of them being the Ponsagon, and there are some units just to the west of the Ponsagon that are actually general season deer units, which is used to be Utah's version of over-the-counter. And uh, and then we have inside the Ponsagon, we have a CWMU. And so those three units combined is where the, the, the bulk of the property is that we hunt. Uh, but it's all within about, uh, it's all within probably 15 miles of Alton, the little town uh, just north of Kanab. And that's where you base your headquarters out of it, their way? It is. Yep, absolutely. We've, it's just a tiny little town. It's actually where I grew up. Uh, and the family ranch kind of surrounds the town. Uh, we've got a lodge uh, right here in Alton, and uh, it just is kind of uh, it's laid out pretty perfect. That's awesome. If I if I do the math correctly, um, when your dad started Color Country Outfitters, that would be the same year I saw you graduated from high school in 1990. Uh, so you must have you must have started the, uh, in your dad's outfitting business right when you were. Uh, getting out of out of high school. I did. You know what I did? Your math your math is good. Uh, I, I right out of high school, and even a little bit while I was in high school, I I tagged along with those other guides and spent quite a bit of time out. And and me and my friends in this rural area. I mean, that's you know that's what you do. Uh, you hunt deer. So, so growing up as a kid in that area where mule deer is all around you, um, were you in love with mule deer? Uh, you know, from the beginning, or was it just something that was so natural and, and um, you know, so much a part of you? Uh, I'm just wondering if it was a passion that got spurred on or if it was just always something you've done. You know, I, I think I had my first deer tag when I was 14, and uh, uh, back then the deer were nothing like they are now, and uh, me and a couple of friends uh, that was all we did every waking hour that we weren't in school or working uh, is, is we went out and chased deer. And so I kind of naturally fell into this when, when the outfitting thing came around and, and there was a, a means to make a little income off of it, uh, we jumped right on it. Matter of fact, those same friends that I used to hunt with as a teenager are, uh, are in the same business as well, and we all work together. Oh, that's awesome. And um, from what I understand from looking at your website, and we're going to talk a lot about mule deer, but um, elk have kind of moved into the area, and it looks like you guys do some phenomenal turkey hunts as well. I'm kind of a kind of a turkey nut myself, so it was kind of cool to see um, that you guys have good turkey hunting also. 
You bet. You know, uh, it's it kind of interesting. We didn't have turkeys when I was young, uh, and they were transplanted about a decade ago, and they have just flourished. They've done really well, and uh, and we do. Our turkey population exploded. We're going to have to get you up here, Jay. There's some uh, some great birds. And those are Rio Grandes, or are they Merriam's? You know, our, our native bird is a Merriam, and they're really pretty. Uh, I've got that really bright white band. What was transplanted are Rio's, and uh, and so we have a little bit of both. Uh, but they've nice. they've just done great. And and the elk, you mentioned the elk. Uh, this area is not known for elk, and uh, to be real honest with you, we we don't want it to be known for elk. Uh, we we started doing a few elk hunts just because. Our goal is to get rid of the elk in this area. We really just want to safeguard the the deer that we've got, and and just don't want to let the elk get their foot in the door. So the reason we started doing elk hunts was to do our part to get them out of here. Uh, but we 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 joke a lot about it. We don't really want to kill all the elk, but we want to we just want to maintain that population, which is quite low. Uh, but uh, the elk is definitely kind of a secondary thing. We only do about a half a dozen uh, tags a year. And I would assume, uh, being a mule deer lover, uh, that the elk just compete too much with the mule deer on the browse and, and such, and, and the competition forces those mule deer out uh, because they're a more dominant animal. Is that is that You know, the truth? I, I mean, yes. My line of thinking's a little different than that or maybe a little more specific. I honestly, my experience here, which is different, we have so few elk and so many deer, it's a little different. But what we've seen, they're really not competing that much for for a food source. You know, I mean, the elk are primarily grazers and deer are primarily browsers. Um, and they're really not even competing here as much for space. Although I believe, and, and I think we've all known elk units and heard about, you know, great deer units. The elk moved in and over a 10, 15 year period of time, uh, the elk numbers exploded and the deer just kind of slinked off. And and uh, and I think that's due to a space issue more than a competition for food. Maybe it's just a competition for space. We haven't seen that here necessarily, but we've done a really good job these last 10 or 15 years of keeping our elk population in check. Yeah, absolutely. So what is it like to have access to country ever since you were a kid that heart, that produces 200 inch deer. I mean, um, y y it's it's almost like living in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm I, I'll be honest, Jay. I uh, I am spoiled. I mean, I you know I I do hunt a lot of public land. I spend a lot of time on public land enough to where I can appreciate it when I'm actually able to go on a piece of private property and, and have it to myself. But we are extremely spoiled here. Uh, you know, just that the amount of deer, the quality of deer, the average age of the bucks, I mean, the buck to doe ratio, uh, it's all pretty remarkable. Uh, I mean, we we can, you know, any given evening, we can go out on a one-hour ride and see 60 or 80 bucks uh, oh my goodness. on just a normal night. And that's pretty unique and uh, and, and something that we've almost taken for granted, although we, we try not to. It's It's pretty awesome. Yeah, for sure. Speaking of buck to doe ratios, what are those ratios? You know, this northwest corner of the Pontagon, which is where we do most of uh, most of our work, uh, is really uh, uh, just a, a giant buck pasture. I mean, our uh, the the amount of bucks that hang in this area is uh, out of proportion to what the rest of the unit is. Uh, this Pontagon unit as a whole. Our buck to doe ratios have been between 50 and 55 bucks per hundred does. Up here on the summer range where we do most of our work is uh, buck to doe ratios are more like 80, 85. Um, Goodness. And so it, it is amazing. I mean, you, you can go, uh, you know, you can see 50 bucks and not see a doe in some areas. It's it's kind of remarkable. That's amazing. Now, um, do your... Are your deer the ones that migrate, a bunch of them migrate into Arizona, or is that more of the southern Pontagon? No, it, uh, the, the Pontagon is really unique in that aspect. Uh, the entire unit moves together. Uh, they will summer on the northern one-third of the Pontagon, and then winter on the southern one-third of the Pontagon, and even spill on into Arizona. Um, and, and they really do you move as one big unit. 
Uh, and so, yeah, every deer that we that we hunt and the deer that we kind of keep track of uh, and the stuff we watch from year to year, uh, they will get back to this summer range about mid beginning to mid April, and they will leave here uh, mid October. And it's it's just like clockwork. It's kind of remarkable. It's not a weather related thing. It's you can you can set it by the calendar. They will move the exact same times each year. Uh, it's really interesting. And so with that timing, um, how do your how do your obviously your archery seasons are probably phenomenal. Your rifle seasons obviously are probably falling right there pretty close to when they're migrating out of there. How does that work? No, you're exactly right. Uh, our archery season is uh, the last two weeks of August, and uh, obviously we were able to watch the deer all summer and spend a lot of time patterning and, and kind of keeping track of the deer. And so we have we've to be honest, we have kind of uh, uh, geared our hunts toward archery. We've even started specializing a little bit that way. Uh, we probably do more archery hunts now than we do anything else. Um, and so our archery hunts, we really have uh, you know, upped our game a little bit. And a lot of the big deer we kill are actually with a bow. And then the last week of September, we actually have a muzzleloader hunt. And uh, and that hunt is good as well. I mean, these deer are still up on the muzzle or up on the summer range, um, and uh, we've got a lot of success with that. And then mid October, these deer go south. They move about uh, up between 20 and 30 miles south down onto the winter range. They drop about three 3,500 feet in elevation, and uh, the rifle hunt is uh, usually the last week, the last 10 days in October, and so. The deer are usually down in the winter range, and that is where the rifle hunt, you know, the, the, the most of the good rifle hunting takes place, but there's no chance to scout. And uh, so even though you've got the advantage of having a high power, you've got the disadvantage of uh, you're, you're, you're kind of just winging it or going off of uh, going off of history. So I'm sure from living up there so long, bucks that, I mean, you probably have bucks that you watch the same bucks uh summer in certain pastures in certain areas and then you also from following them down to the winter range maybe not following their progression but boom there's that deer and all of a sudden he's now down on his winter range and my question would be um do they i know they summer a lot of times same bucks in the same area do they winter in the same areas meaning can you find a specific buck uh, because you've patterned him for three or four years and figure out what he's doing in the winter? You know, that, uh, that is the part of, of my, uh, my job that I love the most um, because you're, you're exactly right. Uh, we're able to watch these bucks, I mean, primarily on the summer range. That's where we spend most of our time. But you, they will be in the exact same spots every year. And, and we're just fortunate enough to be able to watch the same bucks year after year um, and a lot of times we'll, uh, uh, you know, watch him progress. You know, we know there's a young one. He looks like a three-year-old, got a lot of potential. We'll keep track of him, watch him as a four-year-old, a five-year-old. Um, it is just, it, it's really interesting to watch these deer grow. Um, and they will be in the exact same areas on the summer range. But but you're right. The answer to your question is on the winter range, it's it's exactly the same. Obviously, they'll move a little in November as they rut. Uh, but uh, but they will be in the exact same same areas uh, all winter long, year after year. In your opinion, um, at what stage, if you had to pick an age, at what stage do those bucks, you know, go from a 170 buck to a you know 200 buck? What what where? I know every buck is different, but in your mind, where is the big movement of of uh, antler growth? Um, <clears throat> we uh we age every deer that we kill every buck that we kill we've done it for about 10 years and so uh what, what we will actually do is when we find a young buck with some potential we'll actually put up a trail cam and uh and get pictures of him every year and so we're able to, to catalog pictures of that deer and then when we kill him we can get the tooth aged and then count backwards and see exactly what he looked like at five, what he looked like at four, what he, what he looked like at three. We've got a, I mean, that's a, it's just a unique opportunity and it's a great opportunity because we, we have learned a lot about deer 
doing just that. And uh, my experience, I mean, like you said, there are always some genetic super freaks out there that are just giants as four-year-olds. Uh, we've, we've actually killed, uh, you know, some, some young deer that we didn't realize were young just because they were giant, you know, they're 230, 240 bucks. And, and then obviously you cry a little bit, uh, for the next few weeks after you realize, how it was. <laughs> but, uh, um, but there's always a few freaks out there for, but for the most part you have, uh, our bucks in this area, you know, you, you get a lot of at four years old, they're, they're a lot in that 170 kind of a range. Um, and then from four to five is usually a giant jump. And and now keeping in mind that uh, not all deer are 200 inch deer. You know, not all deer right, treated right. equal. But but let's just say this deer genetically was going to be a 205 buck. You know, say he's, he's 175 as a four year old, make a giant jump as a as a five year old, and maybe be 190, maybe 195. And then from from five to six, we also see a, a pretty big jump. Maybe not as big from four to five, but pretty big from five to six. You'll see a jump. And at six, you know, maybe maybe as good as he's going to get. You know, maybe he's two hundred five at six. Uh, about half the bucks that we kill, their best years they're six, and their best and and the other half of their best years they're seven. Um, and not, and not even that we killed all of them, but you know, as we as we kill them when they're older, and then look back on them. Uh, about half of them, their best year was six and half it was seven. Uh, so it, it is kind of interesting. So Wade, on the big jump between six and seven, or say from five to seven, you get uh, most of your big bucks are six or seven. My question would be then after that, uh, they start regressing. What are some of the things that you notice with say a seven-year-old buck that say is just perfect genetics, you know, 230 buck, just a beautiful buck. What do you see then if you don't harvest, what are the characteristics that, that immediately you start seeing the next couple of years? Um, I think the things that we've seen is, uh, is that they get, uh, they get cooler. They just, they just, you know, old bucks just have that look about them. Uh, you know, these eight, nine and 10, we've actually killed a couple that were 11 and 12 that they just have that look about them. Uh, they just look cool. You know, maybe they're not the best scoring buck on the mountain, but they have got that eye appeal. Uh, they definitely, uh, start to get a little more mass around their base. Uh, and, and their, their horn configuration actually kind of changes. Uh, instead of being nice and boxy, uh, they actually lose that angle. And they start to get a little more V-shaped. Um, they will start to lose a little tine length uh, and, and, and just get a little heavier out on the ends. Um, the the uh, the extras, a lot of bucks we've seen with extras will keep those extras. Uh, interestingly enough, it's their typical frame that'll suffer with age, not necessarily their extras. Um, although sometimes they'll shrink back as well. But but they definitely they look cool. I mean, there's. I'd almost just as soon shoot a 200-inch nine-year-old with a bunch of characters. I would, you know, just some giant deer that scores great just because of that look they have. And I know on <clears throat> white-tailed deer, uh, I've got a friend, Bill Winky, who's, uh, you know, really into the white-tailed deer back in Iowa, and he's, you know, considered one of the authorities on whitetail, and he really talks about you know, after a, a deer gets four years old, when they start five, six, seven, how, how they're their body changes, that the, the pot belly comes in, the shoulders seem to broaden out. Um, is this is that the same with mule deer as far as the body characteristics as they start getting, you know, older? What do you see? Yeah, no question about it. Uh, it, it we've started to see their body uh, mature about the same time as their horns do. When, the, when their horns are in their prime, it's about when their bodies, you know, kind of stop growing. It's interesting that, you know, they their bodies really are growing as four-year-olds and five-year-olds and sometimes even even six. Uh, they definitely get a little heavier in the front end. Uh, they put more weight, you know, with the base of the neck down through the shoulder, the brisket, uh, and then just that girth behind that front leg, uh, that girth gets a lot bigger. We take a lot of data off each buck that we kill, um, and, uh, and a lot of these same measurements I'm talking about, uh, and, and they definitely get a little more width across the back. Uh, their, their head, it really changes. Uh, you know, the width of their head, uh, their eyes, you know, just the whole proportion of their head, 
to me, that is one of the easiest ways to judge a deer is, is just in his front half of his shoulder, his neck, and his head really tell the bulk of his age to me. Uh, you know, deer are no different than people in their body growth. We have some young deer that their bodies grow really fast. Um, and, uh, you know, just like kids, you know, you can have a six foot, 12 year old, uh, and deer aren't a lot different, although it's rare, same as it is in people. Um, but that head and neck, you know, that face configuration is, is kind of the one thing that, uh, that gives it away as far as age to me. What do you notice? Um, this is all real fascinating to me, um, being able to age these deer and kind of watch them from year to year and, um, what do you notice with their characteristics as they get older as far as their behavior? Um, how does their behavior change the more mature that they get? Yeah, that, that's actually a great question. Uh, it was something me and, me and uh, uh, all the guides were talking about just uh, a few weeks ago. Um, we were able to hunt these deer in a pretty controlled setting, and these deer – we actually like when we're archery hunting on the properties which we have control over we will actually designate areas as as just a sanctuary that we never go in that area we don't set up cameras there we don't do anything there the only time we ever go in those areas is if we're blood trailing a deer all year long that's it so they have areas where they feel very safe and it's very controlled and so these deer do what they want when they want and it's been interesting to watch them as they get older. You know, as three-year-olds, two-year-olds and three-year-olds, they just do whatever they want. You know, they're up in the middle of the day feeding. They're, you know, they walk in the middle. Of the day. They just don't care. They're just doing whatever they want. As four-year-olds, you start to see them kind of pattern themselves just a little bit, but they're still pretty careless. Uh, you know, they just, they, they, they'll get up early in the afternoons and, and early evenings. Uh, really start to see a difference when they hit six. Uh, there's no doubt about it. And, and these are, for the most part, unhunted deer. You have to keep in mind, everybody thinks deer get smart because they get hunted a lot. For the most part, these deer are unhunted. We watch them, but we never hunt them. Yet, with age, they still get smarter. And uh, you, you start to see it at six. Um, they just, they get more nocturnal. Uh, they will they will come out, you know, right before dark. Uh, so a lot of times they're bedded at daylight. Uh, and you start getting these really old bucks, these six and, or seven and eight year old bucks. Uh, we just killed one in 2014 that we hunted for five years and I had honestly given up on him. I just, I thought, uh, the area he was living in, uh, was unhuntable. The only time we could hunt him was on the archery hunt and we couldn't go to him and he wouldn't come to us. He literally would be bedded every morning at four o'clock in the morning and would not get <laughs> up until 10 minutes after dark every night. I mean, it's just, it's amazing the, the way some of them live. And uh, anyway, it's, you're, you're, you're absolutely right in your question. These deer definitely change as they get older. So, so with, with them not being hunted, um, you know, like on, say, public land where there's just people everywhere. So the argument that they, they get nocturnal and they do that is because of pressure, you would argue that just behaviorally that's just what they that's just what they do as they get older not necessarily they're getting smarter they're just they they lay more and they're, they they get more nocturnal just just that's just what they do I, and yes i mean yes and no i agree with both sides of the argument i think these deer literally get smarter as they get older whether they're hunted or not but i also think they get a lot smarter because they are hunted i mean old bucks on public land that just get hammered over and over and over no question that buck is going to behave differently than, a, than a, the, the same age of deer that has never been messed with. Uh, I think they can be pushed even farther, you know, if they get hunted a lot. But, uh, but it's not just hunting alone that makes them that way. As a hunter, my question would, would I'm curious about um, this, the summer grounds, hunting these bucks with, with a bow and arrow. Um, are there any... Um, vegetation types or terrain uh, types that you would say specifically that maybe the, the, the six, the seven, the eight-year-old bucks tend to hang in uh, different than, say, a two or three or four-year-old deer? I mean, 
um, trying to figure these deer out and, and, and to become tactically a, a better hunter, um, I would ask you what, what vegetation types and maybe what contour or is there, is there some variable that you would say if you were weighed, uh, taken down to, you know, Montana or taken to another state and just thrown in there and you're trying to find an old age, older age class deer, what are you looking for from what you've learned uh, in all your experience? You know, I, I think that's a, 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 it's a tough question, but I think it's got several, several uh, uh, answers to it. Number one is our experience has been these bucks live regardless of what their age is. These bucks live in the same place. They live in the same place their mother raised them. And uh, it's been interesting. You know, we talk about these bucks coming. Uh, we will see the same buck bedded under the same tree year after year after year. Well, that's usually within a mile of where his mom raised him. That may be a mile from a hay field in a, in a major highway, or that may be at the tip top of the peak above the rim rock. Um, uh, these bucks will just simply live where their mom raised them. And so obviously mom is going to live in an area with a good food source. And so number one to me is you've got to find a good food source. Uh, you know, whether that be in the bottoms, whether it be bitter brush flats, uh, whatever it is, you've got to find a good food source because that's where mom's going to raise him and that's where the buck's going to live. It's been really interesting to me. Uh, we kill giant deer uh, scattered across every inch of these properties that we have. Uh, literally a half a mile from a major highway, and we kill the exact same caliber and age of buck at 10,000 feet above the rim rock. And uh, the notion that uh, the giant bucks, uh, you know, are all going to go at the top. The older they get, the more reclusive they get, they're going to go to the top of the mountain really isn't true. You know, if you're able to hunt an unhunted population, which is a, kind of an oxymoron, but that in, this, in essence <laughs> is what we're doing. You know, we're, uh, you know, we have, uh, we probably harvest less than 1% of the bucks uh, that we, that we uh, have access to. So the vast majority of it, it's an unhunted population and these deer go wherever they want to go. I mean, it's not a, they go to the top of the mountain, uh, you know, they're above tree line or they're, you know, in the bottoms in the thick stuff. They really are everywhere. And, uh, uh, it's just wherever mom raised them, and that's where they get comfortable. And, and if, if they don't have an outside source, you know, pressure pushing them into a new area, they're going to be right there near food. I mean, these deer, you know, they're no different than people are. They're going to they're gonna live where it's easiest. Uh, and and I'm, I'm a firm believer that uh, they don't want to have to walk to the top of that mountain scale, you know, a, a thousand foot uh, increase foot increase uh, to get to where they bed every night unless they have to they want to live as easy as they can and so we do find just as many giant deer right down in the bottoms as we do right on top but, but would you agree also that with a bunch of pressure deer can learn that being up away from people that they can actually live longer do you think do you think do you agree with that a that, that they can learn to 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 live away from people absolutely uh you know there's no question deer are smart and, and they're going to go where they they don't get messed with i think the other part of that equation is in in heavily hunted populations of deer the deer that live by the road die yep. <laughs> so just by <laughs> default the deer that stay alive are up on top of the hill now i also think a few that are on the bottom that get smart go to the top of the hill but uh uh no doubt yeah, absolutely. That's that's all great stuff and stuff that I'm really interested in. Um, let's talk a little bit about bucks that you guys have harvested. And I guess first and foremost, um, what's the biggest buck you guys have ever you guys have ever harvested? Um, or or the biggest handful. What's kind of okay. the top four or five? So I I don't uh, I don't count cactus bucks. Uh, as you know especially a score they they can artificially sure. inflate the score so easy with all those little points so so removing the cactus buck equation we have we have killed some some great deer uh interestingly enough <clears throat> the pontagant 
the management of the Pentagon has changed a lot in the last six, five, six, seven years. And the best years the Pentagon has ever had. Um, and, and I know not everyone agrees with me on this, but, but I am fairly convinced of it. The best years the Pentagon's ever had has been the last four. Uh, permit numbers were cut. There were a lot of management uh, changes made. And the Pentagon is better right now than it's ever been, uh, even before it was just opened. Uh, right when it was first opened, there were some giant deer killed, and everybody said, you know, that's the heyday of the Pentagon. We have had guys that hunted the year or two after the Pentagon was just opened, and they come and hunt now and said the numbers of bucks have tripled from what they were back then. Uh, keeping in mind, the Pentagon was closed not to increase trophy quality. It was to increase population. Uh, the deer were struggling. That was why it was changed. Uh, and so anyway, the last three or four years have been phenomenal. And so some of the best deer we have ever killed have been, have been just recently. Uh, the biggest, the highest scoring deer we have killed was actually just last year. Uh, we killed a buck that was 259. Uh, the three or two or three years previous to that, uh, we killed a handful of bucks that were, uh, that were in the low 240s. Um, each year we will kill one or two that are, you know, 235 plus. Um, it's, uh, it's just been remarkable. I mean, I, I've been around this for 20 years. These last few years have surprised me even. I mean, it's, it's been remarkable. That's great. And is there any sign that uh, that those uh, regulations are going to change and become more liberal, or are they pretty steadfast in keeping it where it's at with the with the high quality that it's back back to you know being really good? You know, I um, we are fortunate right here in this area, and and maybe I can take just a minute to talk to your listeners about this. We formed a committee. Uh, for this area, for the Pentagon uh, specifically, about 10 years ago. There were some guys with some foresight that started a committee. That committee has become very instrumental in the management of this herd. And uh, we've actually gotten to the point where it, it's, a, it's a wide variety of guys, and, and everyone's got something invested in it, uh, whether it's private property owners, sportsmen, ranchers, BLM. I mean, everyone is at the table on this committee. And, uh, and, and because of that, it's become a great committee with a lot of value and a lot of insight. And the, the, the Division of Wildlife's realized that, and they've actually kind of partnered with us. And the committee has a lot of say in the management of this unit. And because of that, uh, yeah, there's no chance things are going to change. Uh, the division has been very responsive to our input, and, uh, and they even kind of let us write it. Uh, and so uh, the committee is, is a pretty knowledgeable bunch of guys, um, and, and they're pretty happy about where we're at and the direction we're headed. I don't, I don't see anything changing. Two questions have popped up from what you've been saying. One is, how many deer are we talking about that are in the Pontagant herd? Uh, right now we're estimating, and, and, gr and granted we don't count, we don't fly in Utah for deer, uh, we're estimating through our population models, it's about 5,000, between 5,000 and 5,500. Okay. And when they had the huge decline, what had happened? Was it predation or was there a drought or what, what caused the deer to decline or was there a disease? No, it was, uh, and this was before my day, so I'm going off of what I've been taught. But uh, uh, back in the 50s and 60s, the deer herds were doing great here in this area and, and much of the West, I think. And as hunting got more popular, uh, the, th this was an over-the-counter area and was one of the better areas because of the high density of bucks. And it just flat got over-hunted uh, was probably the number one thing. And, and then obviously predators was right behind that. Uh, there wasn't a, a great drought at that time. I think it was a combination of those two things, hunting and, and predators. I, I, I honestly think those two things are the cause of our problems most of the time when we start talking about total populations. Um, uh, but uh, the predator issue is definitely what works on those fawns and the does, um, and it can really decrease your population. And uh, they, they had gotten to the point where, I mean, closing an area to hunting is a pretty drastic measure, and, uh, and they did that here. I believe it was uh, in 1980. 
And uh, your predation problem now, I mean, do you guys have a lot of lion hunters and do you have uh, guys that are really either A, trapping coyotes or, or B, hunting coyotes or, or I don't know the regulations in Utah? We, we've actually got a great program in Utah. The Division of Wildlife in Utah is, is uh, just really proactive. Uh, they just have got a lot of insight as to what the problems are and how to solve them. And so they've instituted a few things. Uh, they're going more over the counter, not over the counter, but uh, uh, the open, it's a quota system for lions. And so a lot of people can hunt. Almost anyone can hunt until the quota is filled. Um, and, uh, and that has really helped. The lion population in our area is in check quite well. Uh, we, we are pretty, you know, we're pretty aggressive in, in getting out there and killing as many as we can. On the, the coyote, which is really the, the, the factor to me, it's the factor that, uh, uh, controls population is, is your coyotes. Um, Utah started a bounty program. Uh, uh, this is probably going to be wrong, but it seems like it was about five years ago. They just increased that bounty not long ago to $50 per dog. And they also instituted two years ago a contract uh, person for each county. So we actually have a, 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 a we call them contract killers, uh, in each county, and ours is phenomenal. Uh, this guy has killed hundreds of coyotes in the last two years. And and to me, that has made a huge difference uh, between trapping prices for coyotes coming up, that bounty, and, uh, and these contract guys. Uh, no question, we've seen a decrease in coyote populations, which were in check decent in our area, uh, we've seen a we've seen a decrease in total population quite significant, uh, which has impacted our herd. I mean, our our fawn to doe ratio this past year was uh, was good, higher than we've seen for a while. Well, it's interesting that you say you know that the the best bucks you know that the the prime time of the Ponsagon is now in the last four years. Also, to hear the correlation of the the, the uh, bounty. Uh, and, uh, you know, hiring the contract killers, uh, I, I've got to think that those two factors right there alone um, are probably a direct result or, or the, the great deer hunting is a direct result of that. No, no question about it. I mean, it's if, if you have deer population problems in an area, kill the coyotes. I mean, it, it is that simple. And uh, our, our, air, our population has always been good, but we, we've done a lot of habitat work and a lot of water work in this area, and, and we want to increase our population. And so that's why we made that big push uh, to, uh, to try to knock these coyotes down, and it's made a difference. Absolutely. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, Ponsagant public land. Uh, for those maybe that are listening um, that might not have the resources to hunt on the on the private, uh, is there still a, a, a substantial amount of property that uh, one could hunt uh, on the public if they were to draw the tag? That's one of the great things about the Ponsagant J is uh, it's 85% public land. Uh, when we start talking about these, this private land, it's very minimal. You know, 40 ranches sounds like a lot. Most of those are very small, and, and to be honest, we have almost every ranch leased. Uh, there really is no other uh, private land on this summer range that we don't have. And so you're, you're absolutely right in that there is some great hunting on the public land. Uh, matter of fact, uh, with our Pontagon hunters, we hunt the public lands a lot. Uh, we don't really care. We're going to go wherever we find the best deer, and oftentimes that's on the public land. Uh, and so there is just some phenomenal hunting. Uh, you know, there's a, the Ponsagon is a unique area in that it has so much variety in elevation and, and, and in consequently habitat. Uh, it goes clear to 10,000 feet. You, you can get up in the in the timber, uh, but uh, there's an oak band underneath that. Uh, and then it spills clear down into the pinion and juniper, and and there's deer sprinkled all the way through that on the on the summer range, um, and there is just some phenomenal hunting. Uh, some of the biggest deer I can think of, four of the seven biggest deer we've killed in the last four years have been on public land. That's awesome. And Wade, uh, as far as bonus points, um, how many points does it take? Uh, 
uh, for to get the archery tag, and how many does it take to get the muzzle loader, and then how much for the for the rifle? So it it has changed a little bit in the last year, simply because there are a lot of people that have been putting in for the Henry Mountains, which is the other premium limited entry unit in Utah. There are there are only two premium limited entries: the Henry Mountains and the Pontagon. Everyone has put in for the Henrys, which only has about a, a fourth of the permits the Pontagon has, which makes it a lot harder to draw. In the last 18 months, a lot of people are giving up on the on the Henrys, realizing they're not going to draw it, and so they've kind of jumped ship over here to the Pontagon. So it's actually increased uh, in difficulty a little bit on the Pontagon, but as a rule of thumb, the uh, archery hunt, and, and these are for residents, I can kind of amend these a little bit for non-residents, even though I'm not quite as familiar. For residents, archery, it takes about 12 points. For non-residents, I'm going to say that's about 15. For muzzleloader, it's about 14 points for residents, and I would say probably 16 or 17 for non-residents. For rifle, uh, it's about 15 or 16 for residents, and, and probably max points, uh, probably 18 for non-residents. Okay. And but you also have um, conservation permits, and do you have landowner tags as well that you sell? Um, not all of your hunting is by draw, right? Exactly, exactly. We actually don't have any. We sell specifically speaking of landowner tags, but there are seven conservation tags that are sold for the Pontagon each year. Those are at banquets in the spring of each year. There, are, there is also a landowner association for the Pontagon that has uh, uh, 16 or 17 permits that they also sell at those same banquets. Uh, usually it's fundraiser banquets uh, with uh, SFW and MDF uh, right here in Utah. And so there are a handful of auction permits that are available uh, each year. So you're so hunting with you. People are not totally relying relying on the draw. They can purchase tags uh, at some of those auctions. Exactly, and, and and or some landowner permits that are sold at the same auctions. Exactly, and uh, and then they can choose to use you type of thing. Sure, sure, exactly. Yeah. There there actually are not any landowner permits that you can buy directly from landowners. In the Pontagon, that's a, a little. In the past, there has been, but that has changed the last few years. Every landowner tag and every conservation tag sells at auction at these fundraisers. Okay, um, and how many archery hunters do you typically take a year? Uh, we will take uh, eight or ten on the general season, and uh, four or five on the Pontagon and six or seven on the CWMU. So we're, we're talking, you know, 20, 25 archery hunters a year. Uh, keeping in mind, though, that uh, about half of the deer we kill are actually management bucks. Uh, the okay. other half are obviously trophy bucks. And so we're actually not killing that many trophy bucks each year. Gotcha. Yeah, and, and that's why your quality is so good. Um, I wanted to bounce back to something. We were talking about antler characteristics. And um, one thing I've noticed with, um, coos deer and with, uh, elk, um, I've seen some animals when they get, you know, really big and they've got extras, have, I've actually seen them kick their extras from side to side. Um, do you notice that with mule deer, say, you know, uh, a, a fork G3 or a fork G4, and then all of a sudden the next year it's, it's forked on the other side? Or do you think that most of the time the extras uh, stay the similar or the same on, 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 on each side? We have seen that, but it's pretty rare. Uh, for the most part, the bucks in this area, uh, as they start to get a little age on them, as they start to hit that five- and six-year-old mark, uh, they will start to spring some extras in the back. And it's usually all in the back fork. Uh, they'll get in lines off their G3s, and then they'll get kickers straight out of the, 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 the bottom of the fork. Um, for the most part, they will stay in that same general area and, and obviously get a little longer as they get some age on them. But, but they usually don't hop back and forth from side to side, although I have seen that. It's, it's kind of rare in this area. Gotcha. Um, that's 
That's uh, always something that's interesting to me. I want to talk to you a little bit about the conditions this year and uh, how things are looking out on the range with range conditions and uh, how antler growth is looking. It's uh, it's a, it's an interesting discussion this year because in 20 years, I've never seen it quite like it is this year. Uh, we had a, a really interesting winter spring summer combination. Our summer, or sorry, our winter was exceptionally dry, as it was in, in a lot of the area or a lot of the west. Um, we we got virtually no snowfall, and the snow that we got, it was so warm it melted. Uh, March first, we had zero snow uh, up here on the on the summer range, which is 8,500 feet. Uh, we had gotten some moisture, but it had all melted. Um, and then we had uh, one great big snowstorm um, that uh, we actually got 50 inches of snow in five days on the on the summer range up high. But it was warm enough. The deer down on the winter range, uh, all it did was rain on them. And so the deer went through the winter with, I don't know that they stood in snow all winter. They had all they needed to eat. I mean, it was great for them. They came off that winter range in, in great condition. And it started to warm up and rain here in the spring, uh, which we never get spring rains. I mean, April and May here, we just, some of our driest months, especially May. And, uh, and, and we got a lot of great rains. Uh, and so they came back to this summer range a little earlier than normal, just because there was no snow. They had great feed, which I'm, I'm a firm believer when it comes to horn growth that February, March, April are, are really the most important months. And they got to the summer range, which has better, higher quality feed. And they were able to get on that quicker. And then what they've had since has been phenomenal as we've had monsoons through May and June, which is just extremely unusual. And and it almost feels kind of like it's a bit of a perfect storm. We're all giddy almost <laughs> how excited we are of what this what this year might look like. Yeah, and I'm sure you're running cameras and looking at bucks. Um, how are they looking? As good as you think they were? You know, we uh, uh, we just started running cameras about the first week of July, and uh, we just got our first batch of cards in this last last week and started looking. So we're just getting started, but. Uh, by all accounts so far, it uh, it's going to be pretty awesome. That's great. I look forward to seeing how well you guys do. Um, I, I want to ask you about some field judging tips with mule deer. And having been around so many big deer uh, your whole life, uh, maybe some of the basics um, of, of field judging, um, you know, what you look for, uh, maybe if you have a, a system that you use in, in adding up, you know, the, the time links and the mass and the spread and everything. Sure. Or, you know, just, just, just kind of run through what you look for in field judging mule deer. You bet. Um, I, I'm probably a little bit different than a lot of people. Uh, I just use some very simple general guidelines. Um, keeping in mind, I'm, I'm a firm believer that, that, uh, being able to judge deer on the hoof is just nothing but practice. It's nothing but repetition. And 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 because of that, I don't look at a lot of 140 to 170 bucks. And so I'm awful at them. I mean, I'll be the first to admit I couldn't judge a deer in, in that category to save myself. Uh, the, I spend a lot of time being able to look at 185 to you know 215 type deer. Those are the ones that I'm pretty good at, but it's just because of that practice. And uh, so really, that's the number one thing. It's just practice. Get out there and look at deer. Uh, the second thing I, that I use is uh, it's all about age. You have to decide how old that deer is before you can start judging him at all. Because uh, a uh, live weight, 180 pound, four year old, 170 buck, proportion wise, looks almost identical to a six-year-old, 270-pound, 199 buck. Uh, Proportion-wise, standing alone by themselves, horns to body, ears to body, ears to horns, head to horns, is all very similar. And so I think some people can make that mistake. It's easy to do. So first, you have to determine 
how old that deer is. You know, is he three? Is he five? Is he eight? You know, where's he at in that in that sliding scale? And once you decide that, then you can go, okay, you know, he's a six-year-old deer. He's a mature buck. All right, so because of that, his ears are going to be about this wide, and his horns are going to be about here. His body size is about here. It makes it a whole lot easier just to determine the overall size, you know, width and height and mass of his horns if you've got a pretty good idea of what his body's like, you know, you know, is he a, is he a 200 pound deer? Is he a 280 pound deer? Um, and, uh, and then from there, to be real honest to me, it's pretty simple. Once you get those things kind of buttoned down, uh, you know, you, you kind of work through your, your time length. Uh, you know, the, the simple rule of thumb I use is, is 18 inch G2s, 12 inch G3s, 12 inch G4s, 25 inch main beams. And, and then, you know, average mass, 18 inches of mass, uh, if you can work through those sorts of things and then just kind of add and subtract depending on what the deer has, uh, it, it's fairly simple. It's just some real easy math. Um, uh, you know, if you if you base the fact that that deer is a 195 inch kind of deer, uh, so it's just some simple add and subtract. Uh, two things I always caution people on is uh, beam length and inside spread. Uh, those two factors. Uh, can greatly influence the score of a deer. They won't influence the look of a deer necessarily, but they'll greatly influence the score of a deer. And a lot of people can overlook them just because they're looking at their forks. Uh, and, and you know, if a deer's got a small beam and kind of a narrow inside spread, he just lost 10 inches and it's hard to see it. Uh, so uh, that's some of the things I use. That's awesome stuff. And um, would you say... When you're looking at these trail camera picks and you're up on a hill glassing these deer in velvet, um, what do you do to kind of take into um, consideration the velvet? And, and um, obviously looking at a velvet deer, sometimes they're obviously heavier because of the velvet. They look heavier, uh, so sometimes their tines don't look as long. Talk to me a little bit about the discrepancy between judging in the velvet and judging the hard antlered. You know, that, that's definitely a tough one. Uh, to me, I don't worry about tine length as much, although, I mean, no, no question about it. You, you're, you're actually going to measure the tine longer than it looks in the velvet. Uh, mass is, is really the deceiving one that I think for most of us. Um, and, and keeping in mind, too, that we've noticed we kill a lot of velvet bucks, and uh, not all velvet is the same. Uh, some, some deer have really long hair. Uh, really long velvet. Some have short. Some have thick. Um, and and so it is is extra deceiving. You know, uh, a deer can definitely look heavier uh, than he is if he if he looks like an average buck in the velvet. It's probably on the light side, light horn side. Um, you know, he needs to look heavy. You, you can kind of if you look at enough of them, you can just naturally subtract it in your mind. But a deer needs to look pretty heavy if he's in the velvet. If he's going to have some decent mass. Do you ever notice um, the color of the velvet, uh, maybe with more mature bucks? Is there any coloration difference in the actual velvet? You know, we've talked a lot about that, and, and we really haven't drawn any correlation. Uh, I think it's just the difference, uh, like in people, brown-haired people versus blonde people. Uh, I, I think that's the way it is in deer, because I've seen some really young deer with dark velvet, some really old deer with dark velvet, some really light colored velvet on some old deer i just i don't see any correlation in age i think when field judging and looking at them when they have light colored uh velvet i i think it could be easy to to think that they're bigger than i don't know if you've ever seen that where they're real light colored velvet and, and they just pop you know and you think they're bigger than they are um any thoughts on that? You know, I think that could be. I think anything that is going to make those horns stand out, whether it be really light velvet or even really dark velvet, you know, anything that makes them stand out more than, than uh, normal is probably going to give them the appearance of uh, maybe being a little heavier than they actually are. Yeah, that. well, this has been an awesome conversation. I want to really thank you for um, being on, I want to give you a chance to uh, tell people how they can contact you. I know uh, your Color Country Outfitters Facebook and your Color Country Outfitters uh, Instagram. I, I always enjoy 
checking out the pictures, but I believe you have a YouTube channel as well. Um, how, how do you want people to get a hold of you if they had uh, questions about hunting with you? You know, uh, we have really enjoyed that Facebook, that social media thing, and the Instagram. Uh, we put a lot of that on there just to, just to share. I'm a firm believer in the fact that, uh, you know, these aren't our deer. Uh, I mean, these deer grew their own horns, and, and I don't care who kills them. They deserve, the deer deserve to be appreciated. They're the ones that grew those horns, and, and not necessarily it doesn't have anything to do with the guy that was lucky enough to harvest them. Uh, and so we just want to share. I mean, that's uh, that's why we put a lot of that stuff on there. We didn't used to. Uh, we, we actually kind of hoarded it to, to try to stay <laughs> under the radar, to be honest with you, and, and we've since repented and, and changed our ways. <laughs> but... Uh, the easiest way to get a hold of us is is uh is just our uh, website. It's colorcountryoutfitting.com, and uh, there's a contact link on there. Um, we uh, I will one word of caution. We're fortunate enough to have a great group of guys that hunt with us now, and uh, and and we allow them to come back each year for as long as they want to. And uh, we've got a lot of guys that have hunted with us 10 and 15 years straight, and so we don't have a lot of openings. Um, but, uh, but I always love to talk to people about deer hunting and, and, uh, and, and if we can help out in any way, especially if guys draw punts and hunt tags, uh, we love, we love hunting this unit and we'd love to help them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I appreciate all the help, uh, on the episode and just, just, uh, thank you for being on. Absolutely. It was, it was a pleasure. It was good visiting with you. It's, uh, it's always good talking about, uh, mule deer. All right, buddy. You take care and God bless you, okay? All right. Thanks, sir. You too. All right. Bye. Well, guys, that was an awesome episode with Wade Heaton of Color Country Outfitters. Make sure to check them out at colorcountryoutfitting.com. I want to thank you guys, my listeners of this podcast, and for all of the support that you guys have given me. And I appreciate all of the positive comments and emails that I get at jscottoutdoors at gmail.com and I just want to thank you for your support. If you haven't had a chance, go on iTunes and give us a positive uh, rating. Uh, Give us some positive comments. That helps our placement in iTunes and all of that is appreciated. Guys, you can follow along at jscottoutdoors.com on our Instagram page at J. Scott Outdoors, my associate Dar Colburn at Dar Colburn, on our J. Scott Outdoors Facebook page, our J. Scott Outdoors YouTube channel. Uh, the fall season is right here on us, guys. Uh, deer seasons, antelope seasons are, are opening all across the West, and uh, guys are getting back from doll sheep and stone sheep hunts, and uh, it's just an exciting time. We've got elk are going to be bugling here soon, and everybody's getting prepared for their hunts. So I want to wish everybody out there a great 2015 hunting season. I also wanted to remind you that uh, if you click the subscribe button for free, you can subscribe for free to this podcast. As soon as I upload an episode onto my server, it automatically goes into your uh, sub- subscription account so you can get immediate access to the episode. Some people are saying it takes up to 24 hours uh, if they're not a subscriber. So that is one benefit there of being a subscriber. I want to thank you guys uh, for all your support and we're going to do our best here to just keep uh, the pedal down and keep bringing great episodes. And I want to thank all the guests that we've had on. And uh, until next time, guys, God bless. Thanks for listening to the J. Scott Outdoors Western Big Game Hunting and Fishing Podcast brought to you by GoHunt.com Insider. Use the promo code J. Scott and receive a $50 Kuyu gift card when signing up for the GoHunt.com Insider. Research faster, hunt more, go to GoHunt.com forward slash insider and join today.